It's a great pleasure for the last talk of this week to have uh, Sam who's going to speak on central limit theorem for random multiplicative functions. Thank you very much, Chantal. Is this on? So, as the last speaker of the day uh, of the conference, it's my pleasure to thank the organizers. Now, I'm one of the organizers, but there are <laughs> but there are two distinct types of organizers here. There are uh, Ken and James and I did various powers of epsilon. Everything else was, of course, done by, as everyone knows, by Chantal, Dimitris, and, uh, and Mathilde. And I thank them very much. And also to Sakina Benhima, who did, of course, a lot of the um, organizational aspects of this. So thank you all very much. And of course, thanks to Andrew for providing the excuse for all of us to get together here. To say something uh, which is a little bit related to the kind of questions that we saw in Adam's talk about uh, random multiplicative functions uh, and precise and more about situations in which we can prove central limit theorems for random multiplicative functions. This is uh, joint work with uh, Max Shu, and Max was also uh, closely connected to Andrew. He was an undergraduate student of Andrew at uh, UCL and then came to Stanford as a grad student. The last time an undergraduate called Max came from Andrew to, to me, it worked out quite well, so I have high hopes. Okay, so, so uh, w the reason for studying random multiplicative functions is the hope that they might model behavior of arithmetic functions that are difficult for us to understand, like the Mobius function or n to the it, if you want to think about the zeta function or Dirichlet characters or some mix of these, or also to understand properties of objects that we like, such as L1 chi, which is sum of chi n over n. And you can think of the values of chi n as just being modeled by a random multiplicative function. And that is, a, uh, is something that Andrew and I worked on many years back and of making it precise and making it precise in the tails. So there are two, now this is uh, kind of a hope. It answers some questions like for L1 chi, it seems to answer questions very, very nicely. But for some other questions, or if you ask very delicate questions, it may not be the right model because the functions that we care about are quite special and might have other structures like maybe they're connected to zeros of things like the zeta function or L functions, which will not be seen in any random model that we have for multiplicative functions. But nevertheless, it may be of interest to study some of these random models and there are two natural kinds of models that we could look at, depending on whether we are interested in complex valued multiplicative functions or real valued multiplicative functions. So the complex case is mostly what I'll talk about today. These are called Steinhaus random multiplicative functions. So you, the function is completely multiplicative. So it's determined entirely by its value on primes. And the value on primes we think of as being independent random variables chosen uniformly on the unit circle. The other natural model that you could look at is uh, the case of real valued multiplicative functions. And these are called Rademacher multiplicative functions. These are not completely multiplicative. You could set them to be zero if, if it's not square free and then choose values on the primes to be independent of each other, plus minus one with equal probability. You can modify this in any way you like. You could think of completely multiplicative functions taking values plus minus one, or think of the values of prime powers as also being random variables. Maybe that's more natural. So I'll just talk about uh, the Steinhaus case, and but there will be corresponding results in the other situation as well. In the last uh, decade or so, these have been studied uh, quite fruitfully and a lot of uh, very interesting progress has been made. Uh, maybe the most interesting progress from for me has been work of Adam on various uh, aspects of random multiplicative functions. So uh, one beautiful result in this direction is, uh, is his proof of uh, Helson's conjecture. So if you look at uh, the study of partial sums of a random multiplicative function, you can ask how are these distributed? Do they have some kind of Gaussian distribution or some kind of limit law? You can easily compute the mean and the variance. The mean value of f, if you just choose f, ran, f piece to be randomly chosen on the unit circle, the mean of fn is just zero. So the mean of the partial sum is zero. And as for the variance, you can see that the correlation of fm and fn conjugate 
it is one if m and n are the same and zero if m and n are different. So therefore, if you compute the square, only the diagonal terms matter and you get the variance to be x. So the simplest distribution that these partial sums might have is that of being a Gaussian with mean zero and variance x. And this is not what happens. So what Harper proved is that somewhat surprisingly, these mean values have more than square root cancellation typically. So instead of the sum of Fn having size square root of x, if you take the expected value of this size over all multiplicative functions, it's really of size root x divided by some power of log log x, this log log to the one fourth. Okay, so it's not a, a, a incredibly small compared to what you might expect, but on the other hand, it's interesting that it has a different asymptotic behavior, which goes to zero, which is little off root x. And before his theorem, I think you would not have guessed that this would be the answer. In fact, uh, I think there's even a paper on which uh, Adam was one of the co-authors where they thought Hel Helson's conjecture was false. So I think that's always a good sign when you don't know whether a conjecture is supposed to be true or false. Now, another question in probability that uh, is very interesting in this context is the law of the iterated logarithm. If you take uh, sums of independent random variables that are say plus minus one, so one dimensional random walk, then it's a very classical theorem that if you look at uh, how large this random walk can get after n steps, it can get to be of size square root of n times square root of log log n. You can, if you ask the same question for random multiplicative functions, now imagine that you have a multiplicative function that takes values uh, plus minus one, or it could also be complex, I suppose. And again, there is this interesting feature that it differs from what you think for a sum for the random walk by this factor of log log x to the one fourth. So uh, Harper has a recent, very recent paper from a couple of years back, which produces values as large as root x times log log x to the one fourth. There is still something to be done here because we do not quite know whether this is the right order of magnitude, whereas one would guess this is the right order of magnitude, but the upper bounds are off by some powers of log log. log. This again answered an old question of Halas, who wanted to know if you pick a multiplicative function at random, whether the partial sums tend to be of size root x. So these are two beautiful recent results, but not what I'm uh, going to talk about. And I want to uh, now mention what uh, will be the focus of this talk, which is to come up with situations where we can prove a central limit theorem. So there is no central limit theorem for the sum over all integers up to x, but what if you restrict to some subset of the integers up to x? Can you prove a central limit theorem for certain subsets of, of, uh, of the integers up to x? And you know what is the biggest kind of subset that you can choose of one to x on which you can prove a central limit theorem? Or you could imagine uh, multi considering sums of a n times f n where a n is some sequence that you choose for example, e to the two pi i and theta for some suitably chosen theta. Now, there has been work in this direction. The most basic one would be if you take a to be the set of primes. So then you're choosing a sum over fp and they're all independent random variables. And this is the central limit theorem. Think of the fps as being uh, chosen uniformly from the unit circle rather than from plus minus one. The central limit theorem really is that it's a complex Gaussian with mean zero and variance one. We saw already in the morning, uh, a definition of the standard complex Gaussian. It's real part and imaginary part are both Gaussians that are independent of each other with variance half. So going beyond primes, you could look at integers with exactly k prime factors for a fixed value of k. So these now start to become dependent, but they're not too dependent. And uh, Bob Huff proved that uh, in this case, k he could take to be something like log 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 x maybe and you would still get a Gaussian in this situation. This was improved by Adam Harper went to the case where K is little of log log X. So a typical number has about log log X prime factors. So these are atypical numbers, but as soon as K is on the scale of log log X, there seems to be no central limit theorem, at least if you normalize by the, by the variance. Another result in this direction, and Adam mentioned this in his talk in the morning, is uh, work of uh, uh, Shauro Chatterjee and me. 
And we actually look, looked at the data marker case, but imagine that's holes in this case as well. Uh, that if you consider a short interval from x to x plus y, if y is uh, little o of x over log x, then we could prove that it tends to a central limit theorem. But it's, it wasn't at all clear what the right range should be. Maybe I should follow Adam's footsteps and ask, Andrew, what do you think? I don't know what the answer is actually, so, so who knows? We know actually from Adam's work that you can't have a central limit theorem if y is on the scale of x or even just little o of x. Because think of this, this is just the partial sum up to x plus y and subtract the partial sum up to x. So it's like two copies of a full partial sum. And we know that the full sum has a bit, little bit better than square root cancellation. So by this uh, log log x to the one, one fourth. So, and actually from his work, it actually follows that even if y is as big as uh, uh, y over e to the basically square root of log log x, that there seems to be no central limit theorem, at least when you normalize by root y. I'll come back to this, uh, to this problem a little later. Uh, this is one problem when, when I wrote this paper with uh, strategy, I thought that the answer would be either y is little o of x or y is little o of x over log x, that one of these things would be the right answer, but it doesn't seem to be the case. We can actually do a little better than x over log x. As, as I'll mention a little later. Okay, so here's a sample theorem that uh, Max and I have. So I'll, uh, uh, state, I'll show it to you first in a quantitative way and then just unpack what it means. So you have uh, a random complex valued multiplicative function restricted to a set A. And we want to give certain conditions under which we can prove that you have a central limit theorem, that it tends to a complex Gaussian. And the conditions are that I can extract from A a subset of basically full density of almost all of A with the property that if I look at the multiplicative energy of S, or in other words, if I count non-diagonal solutions to M1, M2 equals N1, N2 in my, uh, in my set S, then there are very few off-diagonal solutions here. So that's the main condition. And there's one other, uh, usually innocuous condition, which is that if I look at the set of integers in S with the largest prime factor, so capital P of S is the largest prime factor of S, with a fixed largest prime factor, then that's not all of S, that it's very small compared to the size of the set A. So if you can guarantee these conditions, then we can compute the two-dimensional Fourier transform of these partial sums, the Fourier transform of the real part and the imaginary part, if this is to converge to a complex Gaussian, the Fourier transform should converge to this e to the minus t squared over two. t squared is t1 squared plus t2 squared over two. And what this theorem tells you is that there is a quantitative way in which we can compute this Fourier transform. The error term is small if epsilon is small. So in other words, if these three criteria are met with a small value of epsilon, then you're converging to a Gaussian. So here's a informal version of this theorem. So the first uh, uh, statement is just reformulating what I said. You converge to a Gaussian if you can guarantee the criteria of the theorem with a small value of epsilon. The condition that, that most elements in your set uh, should not have the same largest prime factor is often very easy to guarantee. If you just take a set with a lot of elements in one to n, then this is basically guaranteed for, for free. If your prime P is large, there are only n over p numbers that can have such a large prime factor. If your prime p is small, then all these numbers must be p smooth, and that also doesn't happen very often. So the key condition that you need to know is that if you have a large enough set in one to n, and if the multiplicative energy is small, so if there are only basically diagonal solutions to m1, m2 equals n1, n2, uh, then the sum of a random multiplicative function restricted to the set converges to a Gaussian. There is some advantage to choosing this set S not to be A itself, but choosing it to be a subset of A. And the reason is that the multiplicative energy of, a, of a, even a one, one density one subset of A can be substantially smaller than the full set A itself. And we'll see that that happens for short intervals. So here are some applications. So in the result that I mentioned of uh, Chatterjee and myself, where we could do uh, x to x plus y with y being little o of x over log x. 
we can now improve the exponent on that to x over log x to the 2 log 2 minus 1, which is about 0.4. Now, this is not to say that this is the right answer. It's just the answer that we can get at the moment. Presumably, it, it is the case that if you take any, any short interval of size x over log x to the epsilon, there might still be a central limit theorem for that, but these methods will not show that. And let me say, what is the improvement over the previous result is that you choose the set S instead of looking at all elements from X to X plus Y, you look at only those elements that have the expected number of prime factors. So one plus little O of one log log X prime factors. Okay, so if you prove a central limit theorem for that, then a central limit theorem will hold automatically for the full sum as well, because they don't differ by very much. Now, if you, comp if you parameterize solutions to M1, M2 equals N2, M N1, N2, so G is the GCD of M1 and N1, H is the GCD of M2 and N2, then you get this parameterization. And you can see that what's happening is that you might think that G, A, H, and B all have about half log log X prime factors multiplying out to give numbers that have log log X prime factors. So therefore, when you now try to count off diagonal solutions, you get a win because you're considering sums over unusual numbers, G, H, A, and B. And this is what leads to the improvement here. We can do similar results for uh, shifted primes. So shifted primes, we think should behave like random numbers, more or less, as far as multiplicative properties go. And they seem to satisfy a central limit theorem. We can also do sums of two squares. And this is uh, a little bit interesting because we are now getting almost close to the full range, uh, almost the whole interval from one to X. We can show that sums of two squares, integers that are sums of two squares, the short interval only has to have y be a little o of x, and you still have a Gaussian. Actually, the result holds for more general sifted sets, uh, so long as the density is less than a certain threshold, which half is less than. The natural question is, what is the biggest set that you can consider in 1 to m in which you can prove that a central limit theorem exists? I guess I would actually think that if you just take an in, a short interval from x to x, x plus x over log x to the epsilon, then that should be true. So this is only the best that I know how to prove. And this is really the same set in the multiplication table problem. The multiplication table problem is the question about if you take numbers from one to n and multiply them by numbers from one to n, how many numbers up to one to n squared do you get? And the, ex the answer is, n squared divided by log n to two times this exponent theta. And, uh, and what this result is saying is that you can really look at uh, how these numbers in the multiplication table problem arise. Um, the set that you use to produce basically all the elements in the multiplication table problem satisfies this problem. This result is essentially due to Kevin Ford. It can be extracted from something in a recent paper of his, where he looks at the largest set that you can construct in one to n for which the product set has size a squared over. We need something a little bit different that the energy should be small rather than just the product set that should be small, but the, the idea is basically. A slightly more general result is to look at uh, sums of a n times f n. So here the variance is the sum of squares of, of a n. And then there are some conditions that we can write down similar to the criteria that I had before under which you can guarantee that you get a central limit theorem. So these are analogous to the previous, uh, uh, previous uh, uh, results. So again, you extract a subset on which has basically the same variance as the full sum. And this is to say that off diagonal solutions don't contribute very much when weighted by these uh, coefficients a n. This last condition is basically the analog of not too many numbers in the set having the same largest prime factor. So one application of this is that if you take these a n's to be uh, e to the two pi i n theta for an, an irrational number theta, then you can get you can get a central limit theorem for these sums so long as theta is not a very very bad Liouville number. So so long as it doesn't have rational approximations that are very very good. So if the distance from the nearest integer of q theta is bounded away by something exponential, e to the minus q to the one fourth or something like that, then we can prove that you get a central limit theorem. By 
Harper's result, if theta is rational, or if theta is very, very close to a rational, there is no central limit theorem because the rational number, the exponential of a rational number, you can just rewrite in terms of multiplicative characters. And then it's just a combination of uh, a finite number of multiplicative characters. And therefore there is no central limit theorem there. So this result would include uh, all nice numbers you can think of like pi or E or any algebraic number and so on. Uh, and uh, there is earlier work of Benatar, Nishri and, uh, and uh, Brad Rogers who did a measure version of this showing that it holds for all theta in a set of measure one while this gives you a criterion that you can check. So I have a few minutes to try to give you an idea of the proof. So in many of these problems, you cannot compute moments. Uh, now in many situations where we actually have functions that we care about like characters, moments are the main thing that we can compute. But in this case, when we are given that something comes, you know, comes from some process, there's some notion of independence. There are other techniques and probability that uh, work better than the method of moments. So what we use here is uh, the Martingale central limit theorem. This is kind of a quantified version of a, of a result of MacLeish uh, from the 70s. So if you have a Martingale different sequence, so this is a sequence of random variables where the n plus first random variable doesn't, its expectation is zero, even when you condition it on all the variables that came before, x1 to xn. Under this condition, you can compute the Fourier transform of uh, the partial sums of x1 to xn. So if we want to show that this tends to a Gaussian with uh, mean zero and variance one, let's say it's a real value, then we want this Fourier transform to converge to e to the minus t squared over two. And this MacLeish central limit theorem gives you reasonably simple criteria that you can check, which ensure that this happens. So the precise version of this result, you could say, well, compute the expectation of the maximum of these random variables and also compute the maximum of the sums of squares if that's close to one. So in other words, what's going on, you have these random variables that, that, that satisfy this Martingale difference property. And you want to assume that each one of them makes a small contribution to the sum. So all of them are small. And you want, let's say we assume that the sums of the squares of them are usually close to one. If those two conditions hold, then this theorem says amazingly that you're tending to a Gaussian. So the case of coin tosses, for example, would be immediate. You might, the XMs would there be plus minus one over root N. Okay, and then they're all very small as N grows. And the sum of the squares is just one on the nose. So the error terms will not matter very much. And you go to, a, go to the central limit theorem. So slightly easier criteria to work with are to replace these uh, maxima and this absolute value, which are sometimes hard to handle by uh, the L4 norm and then the square of the square, which is also kind of an L4 norm. So in other words, these are weaker than MacLeish's theorem, but what they reduce to, uh, they reduce the problem to computing some fourth moments. And if you can arrange that the fourth moments work out well enough for you, then you get a central limit theorem rather than having to compute all higher moments. So here's a, a one minute idea of the proof, which of course will not be a proof. There's un, there are other ideas that are, that are omitted here. Well, if the XNs are all small, which is one of the conditions in the proof, you can just replace E to the IT XN by a couple of terms in its Taylor approximation. Okay, so that's the first step. If the sum of the XN squares, so then multiply that out, and if the sum of the xn squares is typically close to one, then you can replace from the second line, from this line, which has the sum of the xn squares, you can replace that by e to the minus t squared over two, which is the, the expected answer that, you, that you'd like for a Gaussian. And then remarkably, the Martingale property simply allows you to evaluate the expected value of this product and it'll just be one on the nose. You can just peel off one variable at a time and compute this expectation. And how does this work for multiplicative functions? This is an idea that again goes back to, to Adam. You can decompose your sum of multiplicative functions in your set by grouping them according to the largest prime factor of the integers n. 
so it's a sum over primes of some sum over all integers with largest prime factor being p. And the point is that this sequence forms a Martingale different sequence because if you fix all the primes up to this prime p, you still have f of p in every term of your sum, which is chosen independently of all the previous primes. And so the expectation would still be zero. So this is a Martingale different sequence. And now you can just apply the result that I stated before. And what you need to know is our various fourth moment computations, which is where the criteria for uh, not having too many off diagonal solutions to M1, M2 equals M1, M2 comes from. That's all I wanted to say about the problem. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Andrew, for the excuse. I'm happy to stay again. So I want to ask, uh, what's the relationship of this result and the result of Harper about k prime factors? Can you recover some of that? Oh, you mean uh, when k is little o of log log x? Yes. I mean, uh, yeah, you could. But also, I think, you know, in Adam's earlier work, too, he's also using the Martingale central limit theorems to, to prove results of this type. Along, maybe along those lines, but I'm interested in when you have these shorter intervals, log x, x of log x to c, have you explored k prime factors in that? Ah, uh, no. You mean, if, uh, well, in a sense, yes. Uh, so like this result that I told you about sums of two squares is going in that direction, right? So it says that if you take a sifted set and if, if you sift with a certain, with a large enough dimension, then you get a subtle limit theorem, even if y is little o of x. So I guess so if you take half a, a log x, yeah, you exactly. get a little o x, but it's feasible that, you know, kappa for a, of a kappa, you might get a point x over log x or something to yeah. the c. I, I, I think it's implicit in some things that we've done, but since you asked, we can probably make it explicit. <laughs> Which one, the, the, those four conditions? So uh, they're not so easy. To, I mean, it's not too bad because uh, because you have the same the same parameterization of solutions, and then what it boils down to is uh, a sum of uh, you might have a sum of smooth numbers in a certain interval with an exponential twist, and uh, because we only want to save very little, just powers of log. Uh, basically, the work of Montgomery and Vaughan on exponential sums twisted by multiplicative functions will apply. So if you, wanted to, if you wanted to change your model a little bit in a way that, so up to some, so up to some number, you fix values at primes, say if you like from Mobius function, and then for the larger primes, you just use your random model. Um, how would all of these things change? Is, is it like, is it then basically that you are just is it of the same difficulty as Mobius function, or is it more like a random? No, you should be able to prove things in that uh, in that situation to fix what happens on the small primes, and then and then see what happens on the large primes. And it is something ideas along these lines are something that we are exploring. Max and Adam and I are exploring as well, okay. in the hopes of seeing if we can say more about what central limit theorems might look like. Okay. So I want to thank Sam again. Thank all the speaker and all the participants that came to that conference. Thank Andrew again for you know, being born and everything he has done over the years. So thank you, everybody, and see you soon. I hope. I'll say a few words. Um, thank you for coming. It's a pleasure to see so many of you. So many I know. Ah, John got me emotional. Yeah, so it, it's wonderful to see all the great mathematics at the conference. Um, I think we've all been stunned by the diversity of different types of questions and wonderful theorems that people are proving. Um, it's enjoyable. <coughs> Can you hear me? I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, it's obviously great for me. You know, a proportion of you have worked with me over the years to see the wonderful work. And it's been great to meet some new people. So enjoy the conference. Finally, thank you to Matilda, Chantal, and Demetrius for making this happen. Thank you. And <laughs> sound and Ken James, but doing the heavy lifting, doing the epsilon squared lifting. Thank you. It doesn't have to be epsilon squared.
<laughs> That's also good. We didn't stand in the way. I told you to translate. Thank you for not making me redundant. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, we will certainly say there was no damage done by any person. <laughs> so, Epsilon is not negative. Well, we persuaded this uh, from this week about your birthday, which made it a much bigger shape than the final time. Yeah. <laughs> well, not really for this. <laughs> One thing we did learn though with this conference is that James should always be chairing every session. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Very much.